I want to uh, read to you an article and uh, it has a picture that appeared in the Edmund Church of Christ bulletin many, many years ago. I hung on to it. That's the, I, we just took a snapshot of the article itself. It says, old man's example wins nine more in Nigeria. And I want to read the brief article that was accompanying this uh, picture. It says, Aba, Imo State, Nigeria, West Africa. The example of the 145-year-old man being baptized into Christ here last April continues to make an impact on us. He had been an idolater all of his life. His name was Maranoyi, and his influence in the community was great. He ordered that his idols of his former gods be burned. And the shock of this ancient man turning to Christ caused two others from the same congregation to be baptized that same day. His first son was also restored to the Lord. Brother Meronoye was carried as a baby into the water where I baptized him. I knew there was great joy in heaven for this one coming to Christ. During the Bible College lectureship on Sunday, July 25th, I was awakened at 6 a.m. by the old man's son, Easy uh, Meronoye. He, um, he had brought nine people from the Hungwa Church of Christ wishing to be baptized. I took them to the riverside and studied Acts 8, 36 to 39 with them and proceeded to baptize each one. The saving of these nine souls was the direct influence of the 145-year-old man who had given himself to Christ on April 18th. His hands and his feet were feeble and weak, and he could not go about preaching or speaking to the lost, but his beautiful example continues to draw many to Christ each Lord's day. How wonderful that the Lord is gracious and willing to accept anyone when he is ready to throw away years of vanity. We rejoice that one who has lived so many years could still be touched by the power of the gospel. Let us be encouraged to sow the seed and know that God will give the increase. What a, what a fabulous story. That, that, that was a missionary's report that they just printed in the bulletin. I've hung on to it. Uh, all, of these, uh, all of these years. As I say, the event took place, this particular event that I'm talking about, it took place in a country, in Nigeria, and in a culture far removed from our own. But when we read about it, as I've read it to you, it, it teaches us so many lessons that we can apply to our present lives here uh, and now. And so this evening I'd like to share three lessons we learned from the baptism of the 145 year old man. Now, when I see this old, old man, the first thing I notice is not just his age, but what his age represents. And his age represents the patience and the kindness and the grace of God. Peter writes in 2 Peter, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is forbearing towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That all should reach repentance. Talk about the wonderful grace of God. And then Paul writes in 1 Timothy, he says, God who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse four. In the end, God's will is that everyone be saved and He is patient about it, as the story here confirms. God waited 145 years, think about that now, 145 years He provided food, shelter as well as the blessings of family to this man. God was patient for 145 years waiting for this man to let go his idols and turn to him in faith. God waited until the last moment for the thief to let go his pride and turn to Christ, the thief on the cross I'm talking about. God waited until Paul committed his worst sins and still accepted him when Paul finally submitted to the truth and God made a great worker out of Paul the apostle. This teaches me something. It teaches me that it's never too late to change. 
It's never too late to repent, never too late to go back. You know, we're never so far that God cannot reach us. We're never out of His reach. Anytime we say to ourselves, oh, it's too late. I just, you know, I've heard people say that. You know, guys, rough and tough guys out in the world, girls, women you know, who have lived hard lives, sinful lives, they say, you know, it's too late for me. I want it for my children. I want it for my grandchildren, but for me, you know, it's just too late. I've just done too much. I've, you know, God, God doesn't want me. God doesn't want me. And the story of the 145 year old man, this man who lived in an obscure village in what we would refer to as a developing nation, God waited for that guy. I learned that as long as we have breath to confess Christ, God waits for us. I learned that as long as we can think and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for a wasted life. I'm sorry that I've done these things. I'm sorry that I, I've, I've used all the good things you've given me for my own selfish needs and I've never thought of you not once, Lord, in my lifetime. I'm sorry, so long as we can say that. He takes us back. God hopes for our salvation until the very end of our lives. You know the story, the parable of the prodigal son, the father waited for him to return. Notice that the brother, he went back to work, he was busy taking care of business, uh, he never needed the younger brother anyways. He was a loser, he wasn't a help, he wasn't help around, the, around the farm. He had gone back to his life. The younger brother, good as dead. But the father, you know, until somebody came and told him, your son is dead, your son is no longer living, he waited, he hoped, he looked at the horizon to see perhaps the image of his son finally coming home. He never gave up hope. God is patient, God is gracious, and He ever hopes for our repentance. So the story of the 145 year old man teaches me something about God's grace, so rich, so deep. You know, sometimes I wonder if we realize that most of the time God wants us to be saved sometimes more than we want to be saved. <laughs> he certainly has invested more into our salvation than we have. He desperately wants us to come to Him. Another thing I learned from the story of the 145 year old man is this, the demands of the gospel are the same in every age and in every culture. Look at this story. The old man was an idolater. And I mean, you know, today we say, well, idolatry is like, you, know, you idolize your new car or you idolize your money. No, he was an old school idolater. <laughs> Statues, you know, nature gods, old style idolater, all right? And he was an idolater as his father was an idolater before him and his father before him. And he lived in the African village a multi-God lifestyle with a different language and a different tradition and a different history, a different view of the world than any of us have in this room. However, when he heard the gospel, which is always the same, mind you, that God is creator and supreme, that He sent His divine Son Jesus to die as a sacrifice for our sins, that he rose Jesus from the dead in order to prove that he was indeed the divine Son of God and indeed what he said was true, that those who believe in Jesus Christ repent of their sins and are baptized will be forgiven, will go to heaven to be with God eternally. That gospel message, when the old man heard this, he was required to respond in exactly the same way that every other person who had heard this message was required to respond. 
when the 145 year old man heard this gospel, he repented. You know, it says he burned his idols. That was his repentance. And he was baptized. He couldn't walk, they said. He couldn't walk his hands and his feet. Imagine how feeble he was. So they carried him to the river and they immersed him in the river, just like we're immersed in the river, in the lake, in the baptistry, in the water. The gospel makes the same demand in every age. Belief, repentance, baptism. And it makes the same promise in every age. Forgiveness of all sin, eternal life with God. Cultures are different, traditions are different, but in every place and in every time, all people struggle with guilt and the fear of death. And the good news of Jesus is always understood at the primal level throughout history. At the primal level. Um, who is it that's going around the world, doing, uh, Hollywood actor is going around the world and uh, he's going to do a series about God. He's looking for God, not Samuel L. Jackson, another actor who, Morgan who, Freeman. who? Morgan, Freeman. Morgan Freeman, thank you very much. Morgan Freeman, who has played God <laughs> and is known as the voice of God, in Hollywood anyways. He's creating a series where he's going from country to country, examining different religions. He's putting a, together, a, I think, an eight-part series for HBO or something like that, Finding God. And I read an article about his research and his travels. And he says the thing that he has discovered so far, regardless if he's in a, a country that, that, that uses Hinduism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, regardless where he is, the common thing he has found in all the countries when it comes to religion is that people look to religion as a way to deal with death and life after death. He says that's the thing he's found. The doctrines are different, the gods are different. You know, for him it's just an exercise in comparative religion. But the common thread through all of it is that people are searching for what happens after we die. And of course, you know, we, we could take a road here into comparative religion and say only Christianity has a leader who has risen from the dead. All the other prophets are still dead and in the ground. Our prophet has risen from the dead, appeared to over 500 witnesses. And so, Morgan Freeman is going to find out that when it comes to a primal, you know, at the bottom of your guts type of need, the fear of death and the desire to live beyond death is answered perfectly by Jesus Christ, who died as we die and has resurrected, giving us the promise that we look for as human beings. So the gospel is always the same, and the response is always the same, and we should always guard against those who try to change the message or change the response. You can be sure that in each generation, somebody's going to try to do this. Every generation, somebody comes along, wants to change the gospel. Jesus, he really isn't God. He's just the spirit, or, he's the, you know, or he is God, but he didn't come in the, you know, they're always trying to change that part, or they're always trying to change the response to that part. But this story teaches us that the response is always the same. Even if you're a 145 year old idolater living in the remote village in Africa, you need to repent, you need to be baptized. And then the other thing that I learned from this example is the power that example has. Example is a powerful teacher and motivator. Although he could not do anything, right, the old man, he couldn't evangelize, he couldn't teach, he couldn't serve. This man's simple example of obedience led nine other people to conversion. 
You know, we, we never realize what power our example can have, for good or for bad. This man's example not only affected his family and his village, but is a source of inspiration to others as the story of his conversion is told and retold by other people, including myself this evening. I mean, this happened, this, this, this is a very old art, it happened years ago. And I've preached this sermon several times because, I mean, it is so apropos, it just doesn't get old. This man brought other souls to Christ simply by his own example of obedience. How many of us can say that we've done as much with our examples? You know, people judge the validity of what we say by watching what we do. Example has power. You know, when you're deciding to do something, deciding to watch something, deciding to say something, deciding to get involved in something, that's a good question to ask yourself. How will I look? What will my example of doing this, saying this, being involved in this thing here, how will that play? If it was a movie and we were going to play it to the church, to young people, to our family, to our children, to those who are not Christians, if we, were going to, if we were going to show the movie of me doing this thing, saying this thing, being involved in this thing, how would that movie play? How would the audience be affected by what I've just done? That, that's a good prayer. That's a good way to filter what you're saying, what you're doing. Now the things I learn in this story are a great encouragement to me because I learned certain things about God that comfort and that sustain me. First of all, I learned that God is good and patient with me, the sinner. You know, if I'm not reaching all of my spiritual goals, I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be worried. I should just keep trying because God is patient and God is gracious with me gracious with you. Instead of worry and fear, I should put my hope and trust in His patience and in His kindness. You know what my confidence is for the judgment? You know, Jesus said, every one of us is going to come before the judgment seat. You know what confidence I have at the judgment? Yeah, none. <laughs> I don't have any confidence in me at the judgment. My hope rests squarely on the mercy of God. That's my confidence. I have confidence in His mercy, not my track record, His mercy. Will I be disappointed for leaning too heavily on God's kindness? Will God run out of grace for me? I don't think so. I don't think so. Another thing I learned from this, just for me, I learned that God never changes. He never changes. His word never changes. His promise never changes. Those who believe and are baptized, you know what? They will be saved. Mark 16, 16, they will be saved. You know, believe in, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those are the exact words. You know, grammar is a wonderful thing you know, if you study it. You know that little, that little word, and? Yeah, that's a conjunction. What does that do? Well, it, gives, it links two words together, gives them equal value. This and that, those two things. Those who believe and are baptized, there you go. There are the two things. Three words, one conjunction, two words, equally important, equally necessary. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. That's a statement from God. I have confidence in that. I did that. I remember when I was baptized, that was the scripture that spoke to me. I read that and said, oh, yeah, well, wait a minute. And the guy who was studying with me, Jim Metter, he said, what does that mean, Mark 16? Go ahead, tell me in your own words, he said. Well, God is saying those who believe in Him and, and are baptized, they'll be saved. And he said to me, so can it, can it be twisted to mean something else, like 
you won't be saved or you don't have to be baptized or it's not important if you, no, I said no. No, I, you can't twist that to mean it says what it says. And then he said, well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> it says what it says. It's a promise, you can be sure. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just exactly how much condemnation is there in, for those who are in Christ Jesus? Uh, no condemnation, zero condemnation. That's a promise. A promise based on being in Christ. Jesus will raise up the believers on the last day, John 6, 40. I learn that there is nothing as comforting as the sureness of God's word to those who obey it. 145 years of idolatry wiped out in a single moment. A single moment. He went from idolizing the sun and the earth and so on and so forth to believing that Jesus would raise him from the dead. One other thing I learned that I wanted to put in this lesson in the following, I learned that everything I do is important because I am a Christian. Not because I am a preacher, but because I am a Christian. Preaching is you know, my service to the church, just like your service to the church may be teaching or something else. You know, my service to the church is preaching, but what I am is a Christian because I was a Christian before I was a preacher and I may retire from preaching or die or something, but uh, I will always be a Christian. My influence may not create kings or presidents, but my impact as a Christian may save somebody's soul. Which would you rather be responsible for? Putting somebody in the White House or putting somebody in heaven? I learned that it does matter what others think about what I do and say because they decide to believe or not to believe based largely on what I do, not just what I say I'm going to do, but what I do. You know, I, I, they say you should have no regrets. I do. I have one regret in life that I can share. I have only one regret in life, and that is that I did not know the Lord until I was 30 years old. That's my only regret. And yet He was patient with my sinfulness and my disbelief for a long time. Had I been God watching what I was doing, <laughs> I would have punched my ticket a long time before 30. So I hope that nobody here who knows the gospel, will not wait one minute longer than you have to in order to obey Jesus Christ in repentance and baptism or being restored to Him through prayer. And finally, I also hope that we won't wait until we're too old and tired in order to serve the Lord. You know the 145 year old man, he couldn't do anything. Thankfully, God used his example to influence others. Let's not wait till we're spent we got nothing left to give. Let's not wait till we got no, no energy, no money, no skill, no, no taste for life. Let's not wait till we've given everything away to the world and then we say, you know, maybe I ought to start serving the Lord now. Let's not always put things off till tomorrow or another more convenient time for our service and our giving to the Lord and His church. The opportunities to serve Him are, are all around us. Each week, the Lord calls us to serve Him in one way or, or another. And so God does wait for us, but we never know when the time for waiting ends and the time for judgment begins. So please, if you need to, if you know in your heart that He is calling you tonight for one thing or another, don't wait 145 years to answer him. Answer him now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.